So now it's just about time. Good afternoon to all of you. Maybe some of you is in a time zone where it's morning or it's night, but I'm uh, actually in the afternoon. So welcome so much to all of you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mats Winder. I'm so happy to welcome you here to this uh, live event. And the live event here, uh, actually on the topic, the new winners of the B2B sales. And I think actually talking a little about the topic, it's pretty interesting talking about winners and losers uh, because not comparing this to, to sport, we know that if you pay, play a final in a football game, uh, there's a winner and there's a loser. Uh, but in, in sales, we're talking about winners and then we're talking about all the others who participate in the market, but do it without the real high performance. So actually here we talk about, you can participate, but you can struggle to create results. You can struggle to, to take a market share. You can struggle to make customers stay with you and create a relationship and loyalty. So actually what we're gonna look upon today is, what is it actually going on for the winners in, their, in the game of, uh, of selling? Because in the B2B sales, in sales generally, but especially in the B2B sales, a lot has changed. And uh, what you're going to see today is actually not just based on my good feeling about what's going on. It's actually based, as you see here, it's based on a study done uh, by the Danish University of Aalborg University, uh, but done, uh, done in a joint venture with a lot of international research. That means it's a research done to show actually what is the characteristics of the winners of the B2B sales. And what we're going to go through today is we're going to go through a little about the report. Later on, you'll, you'll get noticed how you will get that full report because you can get that one to read it because there's a lot of stuff that we don't even address today. But the report will show you a little. But what we'll start with, we'll start a little bit about the background of the research. Why did they actually do it? Because one of the main reasons for doing this was, of course, the changes that happened during uh, COVID because COVID forced a lot of sales organizations to change the way they were selling and the way they were addressing uh, their clients. So that's actually the basic fundamentals of why we did this study. And then we've been speaking a lot about, uh, and there must be a post, uh, a post COVID. And we are probably post, or we are at least now living with COVID in the society. And now it's ready, it's time actually to check in. I know there's a lot of other challenges going on in the world, but let's forget about this for the next 60 minutes and then join the research. And then after a short, uh, a short deep dive in the research, then we'll go through a couple of topics that are some of the most important topics to know about. And, uh, and I'll give you some example of how you actually address them, how you change your organization, how you actually make you ready to be one of the winners uh, in the B2B sales. But let's just start with actually that background for doing this research. One thing here is for sure, what we saw is that customers have changed. Here are the three most important things for you to know. Three most important things to you, for you to know. First, you need to know that there is an accelerated change of behavior for using digitalization. Digitalization means that customers, they still want to see a salesperson, but they definitely want to be serving them themselves in part of the buying process. That means in part of the customer journey. We come back to that. That acceleration took far, to, to, to really speed and pace during COVID because we had to do it. And understanding that digitalization here is not only self-surfing, it's also chat functions. It's also that you can actually have these online meetings that a lot of us got to learn. That's actually a great tool. And that digitalization has really made an increase in how it actually works. So digitalization is no longer discussion. It's a necessity when you work in B2B sales. That is the first change with customers. The second change that has really become very important to understand is that even very high complex buying processes has gone online or at least gone more online than before. That means even if you're buying complex systems, software, IT systems, machines, a lot of this stuff has gone more or less 
online. That means a, a big part of the buying process, we'll come back to that, is done online. That's interesting because that forces us, even that we are selling very complex solutions, that forces us to think about how we can actually be more online, be more present and be more ready for our clients uh, when they want to buy. That means we service them in a different way. Still, to just calm all of you down, there's still a need for the salesman or the sales lady. There's still a need for us, but we need to change the way we do. And that definitely we'll see also in the research has forced a lot of the, the results we see here that uh, things has changed a lot. Then the last part, what changed with the buyers. And remember, this is how customers changed. Digitalization, buying online, more complex. And then the last part, a very important part, there is a feeling of information overload with the buyers. That means they still want information, but because we all try to go digital and we're all trying to impress them with a lot of information, actually what they feel is there is an overload. They're not, they're not telling they don't want information, but they're telling it's very difficult to find my way. And that means people actually need to be guided. And what you actually see here is, that's interesting because that calls for something from our side as B2B salesperson. How do we help them to not have that feeling of information overload, but instead have the feeling of actually feeling that I get the relevant information, valuable information at the right time. So this is really interesting. And that's actually what we saw here. That is that these three things are the main reason for the changes. Digitalization, complexity going online in the buying process, and then a feeling of information overload. Don't stop giving people information, but start thinking about what kind of information you give them, when you give it, and what you give. So I think what we need to understand here is uh, that actually this research was based on these three things. Then we done the research. What we did is we asked a lot of sales and marketing people, CSO, CMO, whatever you call them around the, the international uh, business or uh, sales business uh, market. And what it brought was this here. It brought one significantly uh, difference between winners and losers. I'll come back to that a little later because two main conclusions are here. First thing is that there is a great uncertainty about what is the right thing to do right now. And you'll see that on the right side of this slide here. You see, we asked them a lot about what is actually the most important uh, thing to focus on to increase your sales in the coming period. People could choose more choices here, make more choices. And what we saw is, and you can see that here, actually a lot of these are close to 50%, meaning that a lot of people see this is important. And that is spread over a lot of things from leadership to strategy, to, to uh, customers and market, to digitalization, and then what we see is people are uncertain about what to do. And that actually identifies very much what we're in right now in selling. We're in a kind of a process where people are saying, wow, what can we do right now? What is the right thing to do? And what we see here is there are some things that are right to do. I'll show them, I'll show them on the next slide. But people are really feeling a little uncertain. And then we see a huge difference between what sales organizations actually choose to adapt. Some goes directly into digitalization. Some goes directly into chasing uh, the competences. We see that people go into different areas. And that's not, that's not uh, strange because that's actually a part of being uncertain that people are trying to do something. But we are lucky because the research actually shows a very, very clear more examples of what the winners, those who have been more successful during the last years, not only during COVID, but also before actually, it shows actually very, very clearly what they're doing. So let's take a look at that. There are four things that has been really impressing for those who are succeeding more than the others. First of all, let's just start. We see that they have an omni-channel sales process. For those of you not knowing what an omni-channel process is, then it's about we have a lot of channels to sell. We can go directly with our salespeople. We can actually go internet-based on our web page. We can use apps. We can use actually chat functions. 
we can use a lot of channels that we can sell. We can actually use dealers as well. And what we see is those companies not only using direct sales with a B2B man calling, call calling, setting up meetings, going out there, those using omnichannel, more channels uh, with information, preparing people to buy, they are the winners. So that means wherever your company is at the moment, you need to consider not that you have to use all channels, but you have to consider what channels will be right for us. That's one of them. That also calls a lot for the second one. Selling is a team sport. And that's quite funny because just this week, I've been for four meetings. And in all these meetings, we are still treating the sales group as individuals. They have an individual based commission. They have an individual based target. And that means we are creating some kind of sub silos in our own organization. We need to understand that those companies having success, they build a team between marketing, pre-sales, sales, service, after sales service, support, whatever your functions are called. That's because what they see is sales is no longer just a department. It's a function in the company. It's a function where you have to create a team. And if you don't create that team, then it's difficult because then you have a lot of lonely wolf, a lot of individuals going around. So that's actually where you really have to focus to build a team, selling as a team sport. And then it calls for maybe the most important part. Sales leadership and sales management has changed. It's not many days since we talked about a sales leader as the guy who followed up. How many meetings did you have? How many meetings did you plan? How many close uh, deals did you close? What is your hit rate? And these are amazing figures still. But if you are leading or managing sales, you should change from leading salespeople to leading sales as a function. That means you have to create a much more holistic view on this. You need to understand the strategy for the market. You need to understand what's going on in the business. You need to understand how to bring the team together. Now we're back to the team because you are, you're in a situation, if you're the sales leader, you have to work together with service, after sales, pre-sales, marketing. And that calls for different approach and different competences for sales leaders. And we'll come a little back to that later because that's a very important part of uh, doing this. And then the last part, not the least, but the last and most important probably, there is a lack of mental balance and health in sales organizations. There might be several reasons for this. Of course, COVID could be one of them, but also because what we have seen during the last five to 10 years is that B2B sales has been under a dramatically changed. So that means change management is also a thing that a sales leader should actually be able to be capable of doing. He need or she need to, to balance their teams. They need to understand how people are motivated and try to imagine you've been a successful salesman for 15 or 20 years. And now we are radically, significantly changing the way you sell, the approach, what you do. Normally what you did is you took it from lead to end order. Today, you might not be the one generating leads. You might not do call calls. You might just do visits. Some of those visits go online. You might then leave it to a technician to take it on. That means to change the behavior of the way to make salespeople successful. That is a huge, huge impact. And that calls for a very strong culture approach. So what we're gonna speak about today is also a little about sales culture. So here we have actually the winners. You'll see it here. And if you really want that report that of course goes deeper than this, then uh, you'll get it. My uh, colleague, Mark, he will uh, send emails to all of you after this session where you will get, uh, where you will get the, the full report. Uh, and hopefully you will get more aspects on how you can improve your sales and more inspiration of how you can do it. But these are the four most important things to know. And then just before heading up for what we're gonna to see today, we're gonna to see three things today. We're gonna to look a little into buyer enablement. Maybe that's a new word for some of you because some of you might have heard about sales enablement that I've discussed with you before, but today we're gonna to speak about buyer enablement. Then we're gonna speak a little about sales leadership and then we're gonna to touch the 
maybe most important topic about the mental strength and the culture in the organization. So that's why we are here and welcome to this. For the last 45 minutes, we'll touch these three topics, buyer enablement, sales leadership, and mental strength in the organization. And just to show you in the beginning, two very important figures here, two very important figures, really interesting numbers because 77% of buyers have experienced the last buying process as very complicated. 77%, that's three out of four, even a little more. Three out of four has experienced the complexity that didn't make it motivational. That's interesting. We're gonna look a little at that because here something must be wrong in the approach we have as a sales uh, company. And try to imagine that you experience a buying process as complicated, frustrating, demotivating. What is the likability that you create a relationship and a loyalty and you come back? No, that gives it, that answer gives itself immediately. You won't come back because the emotional feeling is it was terrible. That means next time you'll probably be looking for somebody else. Will you recommend this company? No, because when people ask you, how was it? You'll tell them it was bad. And one of the things that actually, when we talk about the mental part of the salespeople, the other number here is not 77, it's 17. 17% 17 is the time, is the time that people from sales is engaged with buyers in the process. That means if we take a buying process, whatever it takes, one hour, 10 hours, 100 hours, only 17% of the time, the salespeople is directly engaged and involved with the buying group of people. And that buying group of people is between six to 10 people buying uh, solutions for B2B. Not, maybe it's only one, one girl or one man or one lady or whatever you speak to, but there is between six to 10 people, at least in the group making decision of buying. So that actually calls for something very interesting here. We actually see now, we know we have less time with people that are buying. We know they feel it's complicated and we, will, we know there's a lot of people involved and we even see that the sales process is getting longer and longer. That's not strange. So we have a job here. We want to make sales process shorter. We want to engage more with the people or at least engage in the right way with relevant and valuable information. And then of course, we want to make the sales, sorry, the buying process less complicated because if we can do that, people will enjoy more. They will definitely tell other people that they should buy from us and they will definitely buy again. That's why when we look upon the topic of buy enablement, very, very, very simple definition of buy enablement, yes. It's methods and mentality to make it easy to buy your product and buy again. That means first time selling and next time selling and again and again and again. So we talk about two things here, methods and mentality. And let's just start with uh, mentality because talking about mentality, we are so used to having sales processes. And I'll just go here because what we talk about now is in any company, we know it's about results. To create these results, we talk about customer experience. Right now, we know that 77% find it frustrating, demotivating, and not really great to buy from B2B sales companies. Second part is we know that we only get around 17% to speak with them. So the direct contact to them goes down and goes down because they're more digital, because they actually uh, use more time themselves. And at the same time, they feel they, it's information overload. It, they feel they are complicated. So here we have to look at this. So first of all, strategy. Strategy is to say, we want to do buyer enablement. Buyer enablement is not only defining a mission or a vision, it's definitely also saying, we want to find out how can we make it more easy to buy from us? How can we make it more easy in the process? But how can we also build a mentality in our own company where we actually want to help people to buy? And try to imagine this, if you can turn this around 180 degrees, you will probably always be speaking about pipeline management, sales process, heat rates. Maybe you should turn around and say, what can I do today 
to make it easy to buy for me? How can I serve people to buy? Because I've said this before to some of you. If you go down to any mall, if you go in, down to any shop as a private person, you don't like to be sold to. You want to buy. That's exactly the same with the B2B buyers. They don't want to be sold to. They want to buy. So first point here is to turn, turn mentality around 180 degrees in your company. How often do you speak about selling? And how often do you speak about making it easy to buy? So we have to start here. Buyer enablement starts with the mentality that we are not here to sell. We are here to make somebody buy. And then when we do this, we can start building structure and processes. Structure and process mean, first of all, talking about team, the team sport in selling. How do we actually connect all these part of the organization that is involved and engaged with the clients? That means how can we make marketing, service, after sales, direct sales, indirect sales, whatever we call them, how can we make them one unit that know they all are part of selling? This is, uh, you can tell it, uh, there's an old story, I'll tell you a, a later time for one of the next coming sessions. There's an old story about how Coca-Cola actually challenged this because what they tell in the organization is either you sell Coke or you help to sell Coke. That means wherever you are, you're part of selling. And here we can actually talk about either you help people to buy or you directly make them buy. That means my job is to help people to buy from my company, wherever I am, whether I'm in reception, I'm in the contact center, whoever I am, my job is to make it easy to buy. And if I always remember that mentality, we help. And that actually builds processes, processes that are not we talk a lot about customer centricity and we talk about being customer oriented. But honestly, if you look at your processes, are they customer focused or are they totally customer defined? Most of you will probably say, yeah, we try to be customer oriented. Yeah, but you're probably focused on making results and selling. I'll show you a little later what, what the change is because it's very important to understand that. And then we talk about the most important part, culture. Culture as understanding what is the thought, the feeling, emotion, and the action going on in the organization. How do we actually think? How do we actually feel? How do we actually behave every day? And when I talk about method and I talk about mentality, we talk about methods, tools, structures, and we talk about mentality about how can we make buyer enablement possible. And then try to discuss, try to think about the latest sales meetings you have internally. You're probably always discussing budget, uh, activity level, pipeline, what can we do to sell more? How often did you turn it around 180 degrees and ask, how easy is it actually to buy from us? How can we go to this meeting to make it even more easy to buy? What can I do to understand the buying process? What can I do to understand the people in the buying process? I'll go into that a little later. So what you see now is, I said to you, three things we're going to look in today, and they are related to what the research shows, who are the winners of B2B sales, the future winners. One part is you build a team. That's so important. And you cannot work with buy and able without building a team because everybody here are part of this. You need to do omnichannel work. That means whenever I'm on a chat function in the service team or I'm in the direct sales or whatever, my job is to make it easy to buy. So if somebody sent you an email and request something, how can I make it easy for them to get the relevant information at the right time and understand how to use it? That's my job. And if I get that mentality in my group, then I created a team. We talked about it, team sport. Selling is a team sport. And now you see, when you understand this, that's my job as a sales manager. I'm not here to count the number of meetings. I'm not here to put a budget in an Excel sheet. That's just the minor the part of my work. My job is to make sure that we in our company have a buyer enablement focus, that we are structured and make process and methods that can help it to make it easy to buy, and then having a culture and understanding and motivation a way that people really want to make it easy to buy. So when I implement buy enablement in the culture, 
it will get that experience people will have when they try to buy from us. And if people buy and say, wow, this was so easy to buy. They helped me in the entire process. They make everything so smooth. Then there's no doubt, first of all, they'll come back and buy again. They'll probably even find us a trusted advisor and ask us maybe even for things we don't have. And they will definitely tell other people, go there because they make it easy for you. Just think about yourself as a, as a private person buying. You probably have places where you thought, wow, this was so easy to buy. You go there again, because now we could go into one of the other topics we've been through, neuroscience selling or neuroscience buying, because the brain is per definition lazy and it's also protecting us for not being damaged. That means if I feel easiness, conven convenience, and I feel that it's safe, I'll go there again. So what we have to have an aspect here is buyer enablement is actually selling to the brain of the customer by understanding their position, their situation, their challenge, their struggle. And normally when you talk about struggles and you talk about needs, because we'll go into this now, then I think you're very often talking about what is the problem with the client? How can we solve that problem? But you're talking about a, a problem that you need to solve when they have bought your product. You see, here's the process. You are talking about they have a need. If they buy my machine, they can manufacture more or they will have a less uh, stop and more running time. Yes, that's great. But before having your machine, there's a buying process. And that's where buy enablement comes into it. So what we have to understand here is, some of you probably participated before. We have to understand, first of all, we're talking about the infinity loop. The infinity loop is the customer journey. The customer journey, and actually, you know, is designed for new customers and existing customers. How do we make it easy to buy? That I won't go into this one today. If some of you want to, to see more of this, you might be the lucky one because today we're giving away five free workshops uh, in which you and your team can have me for one hour and we'll discuss how you can actually work with buy enablement or whatever you want to discuss. We'll discuss that for one hour. That's free. Mark, my, uh, my colleague, he will give you a form that you can sign up if you want that workshop. Five of you will be the lucky winners. So here you actually have an option. But customer journey. Customer journey is the journey customers go through when they want to buy. This is the infinity loop to see that we sell to new and to existing. We'll go into the next level. This one we won't go deeper into today. To make it very easy to understand a customer journey, we put it in four steps. And this is always seen very much with the sales approach. Because what happens is customers get a need, then they gather information. When they do that, they ask everybody else about recommendation, and then they get ready to buy. So now we have the customer journey, very simple version. It's of course more complex. But what we can see now is, we can now start going into this one because what we can create here is, we can actually create a buyer enablement process that is aligned with this process. So what we see here is, normally when we talk about the infinity loop, we talk about people getting aware. That's actually what's happening here. They get aware of what's going on. When they have this awareness, what happened then is they start considering. The consideration goes here, and then they are getting more information, they get recommendations, and then they are evaluating what should we actually do. These things are going on. So how can we actually help them? Remember, you still haven't sold anything. You're just making them ready to buy. There are four steps here, and then even more important, there are two underlying things, two underlying things that we really need to understand. So how do we get started with buyer enablement? The first step is that we have to understand what is their situation in the company. That means right here, customers are doing what they call problem identification. They are actually trying to say, we need something but we really don't need know exactly what it's going to do for us. Internally in a company here, you have to know who is engaged and involved in this process, because it might be 
let's say you need a software to, uh, to handle salary payments. Then you know you have an HR department, you have a bookkeeper, you have a financial department, you have maybe some uh, GDPR, some uh, taking care of information, you have an IT department, you already have now five departments. You might even have a leadership team. That means we have now first step here, a problem identification. What should the product do for us? So if you can service them with information online, relevant information, how do you identify your problem? It can be small calculators online. It can be a conversation talking about this is the first step. And you need to understand there is one problem in the HR department. There's another one in IT. There's a third one in leadership. There's a fourth one in, in the financial department. We need to understand that that problem is not just we need a system to save time. It's also security. It's also a lot of other stuff that's going on. So at first step is to make everything that we present, everything we tell about, understand that in the early stage, they are just wanting to have problem identification. Then we move on because now what they need is solution explanation. Very often we are afraid of telling about solutions because we have learned so much about need, need, need. Yeah, but now I want to know how it works. And that's actually one of the things that we hear very often from B2B buyers. Tell me very easily how it works because I have a problem. And if you cannot explain me how that problem can go away, I don't want to buy. So we have to practice actually that we can make very, very easy explanation online, virtually, or even physically when we are there. How do we make it easy? Because right now they are considering. Remember, here they just got aware. Now they're considering. So how do we actually make a system that can help them to configure, help them to know how that system can work together with other systems? How do we practice as salesperson that we are so strong in explaining exactly how product work? I don't know how often you tried it. I tried it a lot of times. I have a big interest in the product, but when I speak to a salesman, he or she makes it so complicated to understand how the, the function is, how the solution works. So here it's actually making it easy to understand. You have this problem, we take care of it that way. And then when we go to this, then we need to help them because the minute they know their problem, the minute they know how the solution works and that solution should of course be explained for HR, financial, for the service part, for the leadership, everybody who's involved. Then we come to a situation where what we do now is we build their requirement. And that means actually we help them. We help them to see, okay, we know a problem, we understand the solution, and now we tailor exactly what kind of solution we need. So here you help them with tools online, or at least when you're in the meetings, you help them to build a solution. And because you're a salesman that only has 17% together with them, what you need to do is not to tell too much about the product. You need to tell about the solution, explain them how it can actually help them and build requirements. Tell them, you don't need to do this because that's overkill, or you definitely need this one. This is your requirement. So what they will have here is, they will have one feeling that, wow, now we have actually the entire requirement. We can actually make a specification. And then what is important here is, as I said to you, six to 10 people at minimum is engaged in a B2B buying process. That means, as I said, purchaser, financial, IT, and you need to know them. They are engaged here, here, here. And during this period, you need to make sure that they all have a validation that it's feeling good. You need to check do they see the same problem? Did you identify all the problems? Did you explain the solution so they're all happy with this? And did you build requirements that actually take all their needs into consideration? The minute you start doing that, then you will help them to one more thing. And that is actually maybe the most important thing for the sales guy. Create consensus. What does that mean? That means 
I know the seven to 10 people. And what I do here is I create consensus. I even might need to bring them together in a meeting. I might need to call more of them. I, and even let us again, take the example, a salary system, a salary software. I speak to HR, HR connect me to financial, but I need to make understand who's IT, who's uh, engaged from IT. I might need to call them. I need maybe to make sure that I have all these requirements as well. And when I have IT, I also need maybe also in the beginning to speak with the purchaser. I might even speak to HR about how they will train people to understand it. I might even go to leadership to ask what is the most important thing for them. So my job as a B2B salesman is actually connecting and creating consensus. Because as I said to you, 77% feel it's complicated. The biggest frustration is that they are arguing internally. And you're only there 17% of the time. So your biggest asset and biggest task here is definitely to make sure that they can validate, did we actually have the identification? Did we understand the solution? Did we build the requirement? And how do you build the consensus between the departments? So everybody will feel so to speak, happy. That's your job as a salesman, because I don't know how many of my proposals I've lost because I didn't speak to decision makers. I spoke to some of them, but I didn't create consensus. I didn't bring them together. I didn't understand how important it was. That means that the sales guy, he's no longer a storyteller. He's no longer just a product explainer. He's understanding the process of buying. He's curious about these people, their needs, their positions, what's in the game for them. And then when you've done this, you can help them to make supplier selection. And supplier selection means don't be afraid that they know you have competitors because they already know. If you think you can keep it a secret, you're more crazy than you should be. You cannot keep it a secret. So having an open mind, maybe even sometimes speak about where are you stronger than competitors? Where are they stronger than you? That means you can actually look upon how do we actually position ourselves? And then of course, you can take it back to the requirements, back to the solution, back to the identification. This is actually what is so important to understand. Buyer enablement is making tools online, virtually, physically that can help them to identify, understand solution, build own requirements and select the supplier. And your job is to validate in all steps. And what you do here is, a lot of you have probably been on, on the internet seeing that you can do a diagnosis. Are you, a, are you looking for a new IT system? Take our tool here, take the test. I just went to, a, I spoke to an energy supplier this morning and they have a lot of tests for, for people to do. Is your consumption in the right level? Compare your house to other houses. How can you do to bring down your consumption? Everything they do to make it easy for me to understand. That's what you have to do. And then of course, you're, you're the one connecting them to all this. That means also a lot of these tools that we have online, the sales guy need to do use them in his sales job. Some do it uh, physically. Some do it when they speak to them, say, well, before we meet, please go to this. We have a, a calculator that will actually tell you how much you can save or how much you can gain. So make them use these tools. But that calls for one thing. And now we're back to this. This calls so much for a sales leader that actually make their team a team. That calls for somebody who practice with the sales team, how we use the online tools. Because very often what I see is, Online tools are developed by IT together with marketing and they're not used by salespeople. Salespeople don't even know them. So how, how do we actually train our salespeople to understand this is the process? And we have the following tools. We have tools to help people to identify a problem. We have tools to explain solution that could be videos or tutorials. We have tools to build requirements that is actually putting up the proposal, asking what to do. And we have even tools to do recommendation, comparison with suppliers. That means you're very often, if you look at a lot of the, the software companies, when you go to their webpage, 
they're not afraid of comparing to the most important competitors because they know that their clients will do it anyway. And remember, I'll just go back to this slide here. Remember what is put up here. People feel information overload. Wow, that's great. Then why not make it easy for them to understand? That means I can actually help them. So I can just make a chart telling them, this is my product. These are my two main competitors. During this session, you probably ended up with me and these two. That's normal. Here, I can actually show you what I can do. And that actually fits your requirement. So don't be afraid of your competitors because you know they're there. But a lot of salespeople, whoa, it's a competitor. Keep your mouth shut. Don't speak about them. Don't speak mad about them. Don't even mention them because your job is not... It's, remember, selling is not a war. It's actually a peaceful situation. So what you do is you make it easy to buy. And you do that by having a job as a buyer enabler. You make it easy to buy, easy to understand your problem, easy to understand the solution, easy to build your own proposal, easy to select the right supplier. You should focus on helping them validate and create consensus. consensus. And what your job is, now we talk about sales leadership, your job as a sales leader is no longer just to measure what your salespeople are doing. Uh, your job as a sales manager is to make sure that everything here is about making it possible to buy. Whoever is doing something, how do we make it possible to buy? That is your job as a sales leader. So I know problem that you still measure your salespeople, but speak less about results and more about process. And I'll go into this because maybe you remember the third part we're going to speak about today, mental situation. I'll just give you one example here. I hope you will be able to see what I'm drawing here. I'm drawing a guy here. We call this guy George. George, he's a pretty big boy and he has a job. He wants to lose 30 kilograms. He wants to go down in weight. He has been on so many diets. He's done this several times. And uh, he wants to do a change now. He wants to do a radical change. So we asked you to be his coach. But there's one limitation because you have to help him. And he knows it's a process. This is, uh, I could go back here uh, to this one. This is exactly what we know. There is a job to do when you want to be on the winning team in B2B sales. You have to have a focus on omni-channel. You have to focus on how to change sales management. You have to be a team and you have to focus on the sales culture. He knows that it's a process. So we also know you have a, a year to do this, 12 months. You're not a coach for him, but your problem is that you're only allowed to measure one KPI or one indicator, one performance indicator. You're only allowed to measure one thing. And what I give you now is I give you 10 seconds to write down what will you measure. And while you're writing down, you get now these 10 seconds. Try to remember, you can measure one thing, but you can measure it as often as you want to, but only one thing. And the interesting thing, now you get your 10 seconds here. I'll be calm for just 10 seconds. Okay, now you probably put it down. If some of you want to write it in the, in the chat, you can do that. But what's interesting here, and, and that is, we know what's going on. We'll put this down here. And I see now that people are definitely writing down what is normal. We want to measure activity. Actually, it's very easy to understand because the quotation, sorry, the equation for doing this is eat less, eat the right thing, and exercise more. That's pretty interesting. But there are more things here we can measure. You see, and I said you can only measure one thing. And what I'm going to show you now is that this is his situation today. This is the result he has today. The result is he has an overweight of 30 kilos. He has been on a lot of diets. They never worked for him. Sometimes he lost 10 kilos, they came back. So he has a problem. We know. Results are created by activities. Activity means, let's give me an example. I start here. I'm ready to start my new style of living. 
on the 1st of January. I have now a goal that is for the future. A goal is that I want to go down 30 kilos. I have a 12 month period to do my activities. This is exactly as you can say in your company. We want to increase our revenue, have more profit, and we need to change some activity. So what I did here, I did my plan. I did a plan starting the 1st of January. And because New Year is the tough one, I took the day off on the 1st of January, no plan. 2nd of January, I had a running uh, track. I should run five kilometers. I only run 2.5 after 2.5 kilometers. My blood was in my mouth. I was sweating. I was terrible. My feet were hurting. The 3rd of January, I had another run. I tried to do it again. 2.5 kilometers out of five. I was terrible. I really felt down. The 4th of January, I was lucky. I had to go to a meeting in the school with the children, so I couldn't do any exercise. The fifth, I was so lucky that unexpectedly some guests passed by for a dinner and I was so lucky, no practice, no training that day. The 6th of January, I took all my equipment and that is actually the fundamental resources I got. I need resources to do activity. I got my running shoes, my membership to the fitness center. I got my books with, with how to do meals. I got all the, all the knowledge I got on the internet. I got all these resources. On the 6th of January, I took my running shoes and I renamed them to walking shoes. And I took away my plan and I forgot about my goal. And the main reason is not because the goal was wrong. The main reason is not because activity plan was wrong. I can measure my activity, that's great. It was not because of my resources, because they were fantastic. The main reason for my problem is my will, my motivation, my energy for doing this. Because if there's no motivation, it's only a matter of time before activities go down or go back to normal because creating will is changing habit, getting rid of autopilot, changing whatever mentality we have in the company. And the funny thing is, some companies only measure results and try to, try to think about if I want to measure this guy, Big George, if I measure George every day, he will not see any change because this 30 kilo takes time because goals come after, results come after activity. That means what we are doing right now is we know that this should bring him there but it will take time. It might even take weeks or months before he sees any change. And it might even be bad before it's good. We could measure activity, but the problem is I put up a plan and I was running for five kilometers, but after 2.5, I was down. And what happened now is that most people will start saying, I think it's stupid. You see how sad I am. I have hurting feet. It's not really for me. They might even say, George, the big boy, he's always happy. You look so sad, George, because he's always measuring what I try to do, but I get failure. What I would like to measure is, I would like to measure his motivation. I would actually try to measure the energy in his mind. And what I would like to do is, I like to put it on what I call the green track instead of the dark track. What I talk about here is in our sales organization to create the best possible results. We need to understand exactly like George. If you want to have more on the channel, more team, if you want to have more energy, if you want to change the way you sell, you have to do exactly like him. You don't need to go on a diet. You need to change your lifestyle in the sales department. You need to change your habits and to do that, you need to change one thing. You need to change that you not always focus on the bad things. That means if you get a lead list and you call 10 of them and only two wants to meet, you don't need to say, ah, oh, 80% don't want to see me because that only creates bad motivation, bad emotion. And that only creates bad reaction, bad action. And that only creates bad result. So instead of saying only eight, Oh, sorry, saying that only two wanted to meet, eight didn't want, then start being on the green track, saying, wow, that's great. 20% want to see me. 
Let's go for this. How can I actually go there? What can be joyful here? Create great emotions. And the minute you create great emotions, you get better actions and you get actually the energy to do more. That's what jobs need from you. We need to measure his motivation every day. Need to help him focus on the green spots because he will have no problem seeing the dark spots. But we need only to measure on a scale from one to 10 how his motivation today, George. And the minute he say five or below, we need to help him. We need to focus on the end goal. What can we get out of it? It all starts with a why. What are you doing today? Because what I just told you here, you said, you hear what I said, a five kilometer route, I could only participate in 2.5. Actually, that's great. I did it. How do I actually celebrate these small wins? How do I actually learn to be happy for the process? How do I actually learn, actually learn that the most important thing is not the results because the result you create today, remember this is today, this is the future, this is the past. And we can do exactly the same here. Put it up here. The result you create today, is created by things that look down in the past. The past means it's something you did a long time ago. And we know that a sales cycle in B2B is between six to maybe 24 months. That means all the things you've been doing for 12 months back create the result today. If you want to change that, if you want to change that result in the future, you need to change the behavior, the activity now. But to do that, you need to. And when I go out, see a lot of sales organization, they're still only, still only measuring on results. They're not measuring anything else. Some of them measure activity because they want to have more activity, more activity, more activity. Yeah, but take it easy with that. Maybe go down and start finding out how is motivation. Have sales meeting where you speak about how do we make it easy to buy? How do we make it easy to sell? How successful have we been? Speak less about the results. Speak less about activity speak more about the good things. I just had a situation here. It was really interesting because now we talk a lot about sales leadership. Sales leaders have to change. That's just like if you want your children to change, you have to change as a parent. And again, if some of you want to be inspired more directly how you can do this, as Mark hopefully put up to all of you in the chat, you have an option to sign up for a free workshop. Five of you will be the lucky winners. And what you can get is you can get 60 minutes where I will inspire, maybe even provoke, uh, giving you some ideas how you can actually start building your chains, building how you can actually be as successful as George, losing 30 kilos in your situation, meaning how can we actually make our sales go even better than today? So the future for sales leaders is less focus on result more focus on process less focus on sales more focus on bias because when you are responsible for the selling you're also responsible for the bias that means you should be more more focused on the buyer experience than the selling process and we are so focused on the selling process instead of the buyer process and then when you know the buyer process then you can align, then you can align the selling process to the buying process. That's actually what we see when we go to this one. When we go to this one about here, we have the customer journey. We know this is what they're doing. They're trying to identify the problem. They're trying to understand the solution. They're building requirement. They're selecting supplier. That's great. When I know that, how can I help them? So what you should focus on, you should focus on the process you should focus on the bias, and then you should focus on actually what works. 
I normally hear sage people speaking about what doesn't work. That's totally crazy because going back to George, I think Tevin, in the same seven day week, he might be eating fantastic vegetables. He might be eating exactly what he should do for six days. And then on the Saturday, he jumped in and he had Bernays with a big steak and french fries. But for six days, he has done great. That day of the Saturday should never ever ruin his process because he has done so great at six days. So we have to keep on saying, I did good, I keep on. I'm not talking a bit about being naive. I'm talking about having a positive mindset. And what we talk about here is being on the green track. Green track means it's not a naive session. And why this is interesting, I'll go back to this now, because this is extremely important. When we start focusing on the negative part, what will happen is that our brain will release cortisol and adrenaline. And what we see right now is that a lot of salespeople are running around being frustrated, stressed, burned out. And what you should be aware of, if you're burned out, how attractive do you think you are from a buyer? You'll see salespeople trying to force the order. You'll see salespeople with no creativity. You'll say, see salespeople with less engagement. And what you'll see is they have less capability of connecting with people because when you're more stressed, you get le less present, you get less attractive. So if you're looking for a girlfriend or boyfriend and you're stressed, you'll never find any. But when you're relaxed and in balance, you'll find them. It's the same with bias. So say to people that are stressed and under pressure, they never succeed. That doesn't mean adrenaline isn't good because it's great to have a kick that I want to perform, but too much adrenaline, too much cortisol, it eats our body, entire body and health and mentality up. Then what will happen when we are more focused on the good thing is we will release, I'll take the blue one here so it's easier. We will release more dopamine, Dopamine comes when we feel happy, comes when we eat, it comes when we succeed. We will feel more endorphins, endorphins released when we feel that we are actually doing something. That means I called these 10 guys, I got two meetings, I'm so happy. Yes, it's right, I could have got eight more meetings, but I got two. So we focus on what actually works. Then we release dopamine and endorphin, and this is, consistently making people happy because dopamine is a happiness drug. Endorphin is a happiness drug. And then what we can build is also bring people together, make it a common responsibility, make it a team. Because what happens when you do this is you release oxytocin. Oxytocin is a social drug. We are together to do this. We have a common vision and mission. I know that a lot of you are living in countries where we build a common mission and vision. It makes us proud. So how can you make people proud about what you're about to change in your company? That is actually leading the culture, leading the mentality. And the minute you start building that oxytocin, dopamine, endorphin, and even make people feel relaxed. When we did this research, I made my own small research. I asked 50 salespeople, how they feel before they go to internal sales meeting. I can tell you one thing is for sure. They all have some adrenaline, some of them cortisol, because you don't need to put them in a sales meeting to tell them they don't perform because they know that already. The reason you bring them in a sales meeting is you want to make them feel motivated, dedicated, engaged, and ready to do more. Just like we want to make big jobs feel the will to keep on. But what you do is you scare them, you put them in. And what you do is you put them in a situation. Yeah, I see that uh, Rennie is putting on serotonin exactly because serotonin and no adrenaline, we'll put that on as well. No adrenaline is, is a calmer, it's a stabilizer. And when you put them in a room and they feel taken care of, they will produce serotonin and they'll produce no adrenaline and that makes them more calm. But today what you see is people participate in the sales meeting 
being afraid of what will happen, being afraid of being fired and sacked, being afraid of not being enough. What you have to create is a stable environment for your salespeople where they feel, I can relax, I can be open-minded, I am ready to do more. That's your job, not only as the sales leader, but that's your job as a sales team. So what we see here is, as I mentioned in the beginning, we start by saying we want to have buy enablement. We build a strong team, and then what we do is we create a buy enablement organization. So what you actually have seen so far is to be the successful winners of the future, you need to focus on this. Use omni-channels, internet, chat function, app, and direct face-to-face -face selling, phone, online meetings. Build selling as a team sport. And that is done by sales managers, not just focusing on activity level and results, but focusing on people, on the will, on the motivation. And then you build a strong mental health in your organization. And for those of you ready and having the courage, courage to have a workshop with me, being challenged, being inspired, being motivated, you can sign up. There's five free workshops. And I really hope that you enjoyed this session. Based on research, we showed you who are the winners of the future in, their, in their B2B selling. And you will all get an email with the report that you can download. And always you can feel free and happy to connect and reach out. Thank you so much for today's session. I hope you enjoyed it. Be one of the winners. Change your organization. Change the mentality. Start with your own behavior. Take care. See you later.